I want to first off provide a little context for people because this this particular conversation was motivated by somebody who watched you coach in the Netherlands, uh, a guy named Dirk, who went to a, a, a sounded like a couple of your training sessions with the national teams and wanted to get your yep. thoughts on on center development. Uh, I see yep. quite a few new names in here. So just as a housekeeping thing, um, feel free to shoot questions in anytime you want. Um, I'll, I'll kind of order the, uh, organize them to be answered as I think they fit the conversation that we're in at the time. So it doesn't matter when you think of something, if it's something you want to put at Jamie, just throw it in there and I'll get to it at a certain point. Um, preferably use the question and answer function rather than the chat because sometimes the chat can get a little filled up with stuff and we don't want to miss something that you might put in there. So with that, we'll get rolling. Uh, and I think the first kind of question, and I actually I followed up with Dirk just to, to get some uh, specific questions, and these are the ones I, I forwarded on to you, and I had some from somebody else as well, yep. is um, I guess setter identification. So where do you start in terms of your criteria for looking at somebody who you think can make a good setter? Yeah, I think it's probably setter and Libro are the two hardest positions to really quantify sometimes. Uh, Libro, just because you're looking at a person that most teams aren't going to serve, you're not going to see their serve receive. Uh, defense, so you're going to see it a little bit. But it, it's a little bit harder to quantify. But I think setter is even harder just because uh, there's very little statistical evidence out there of what makes a good setter unless you're really diving deep into stuff. Whereas an outside hitter, you can look at stats and kind of make some decisions on that. But uh, so I think it's really hard to quantify, and I think it depends on the level a little bit. Um, I think you want to teach all your players how to set early on and kind of get an idea of who's going to be good there. But uh, I think you kind of got to dive in, and I know one of the questions you're going to ask is what makes a good setter, but you got to dive into the nitty-gritty of it too. And I, I think this person has to handle a bigger uh, cognitive load, so just has to think about more during the game. So who can handle that entire thing? Uh, I think you want to look for someone that obviously has a pretty good touch on the volleyball and is able to control the volleyball in a lot of different ways. So with their hands, with their platform, um, and you want to look for those things. Um, and, and again, it depends on the level. If I'm coaching an elite level national team, I want someone that's going to be able to throw the ball long distances. Uh, so it's strong enough to run to the zone four area of the court and set a ball back with speed. Uh, and the opposite, they're able to go back and do the same thing from back there. And then I think the other thing is just there's a lot of pressure put on the situation. Uh, when you get to 14-14 in the fifth set, that person has to usually make a play call unless the setter, uh, the coach is going to do it. Uh, that person has to go out there and probably do one of the most difficult skills in volleyball that has to be done the most accurately every single time. So just that person that's going to step up to that moment that's going to keep their head in the game uh, and understand, hey, this is what needs to be done. This is who needs to be set. This is the play I need to run. And then go out and be able to do it. And then think on the fly also. If that rally goes on, even if the coach gave that person uh, the play call, that, that doesn't apply anymore. The rally is going and that person has to think. So uh, it's it's a really messy, and I don't, I don't know if there's a right way to say it. I think it's one of the hardest things to really identify who that person is. Yeah, I might throw out there um, for younger s situations, the, the kid who reads the game really well, who just yep. sees it, anticipates the plays that other, you know, everybody else is standing around and they're already making a move to, to release the whatever their responsibility is. Yeah, and that younger, I mean, we can get into long-term athlete development in this too, but I mean, if you're coaching 12s, everybody should be a setter. Mm -hmm. I mean, you should be teaching everyone how to do this and everyone should get a turn at it so that, hey, maybe one day that's going to happen. And if you look at USA Collegiate Volleyball, look at Penn State, the two best setters that came through that program weren't setters when they got there. And Alicia Glass and Micah Hancock, um, those two players were made into setters. So you can take a good athlete too, but those two players were taught how to be good volleyball players from a young age. And then when they needed to make a change, they made it. Uh, and I think you look at Misty May also. I mean, she was one of the best setters in the world probably during her collegiate tenure and then became a great beach player because she could play the entire game so i think that gets lost sometimes in volleyball today just we need to teach people how to do everything and then we can sort out where we put them later on so well to that end because actually uh, this comes up in dirk's questions as well um obviously misty alicia they're rare examples of people who change position later in their career 
when would you probably start thinking about specializing for the younger kids? Yeah, younger kids, like, I think I think I did an article for Dirk, actually, and he asked me this question, like, what is important at different ages? Because we were talking about long-term athlete development. And I told him, I think from, I don't know, whenever they start to 13, 14, your job is to just simply get them to fall in love with volleyball. Uh, if you're talking about long-term athlete development in terms of producing the best player in the world, those people aren't good because someone forced them to be good. Usually, there's a few uh, probably different examples of that, mostly in communist countries, but uh, they're usually not forced into it. These are people that fell in love with this game, and you're seeing YouTube clips and uh, Instagram and TikToks of all sorts of kids around the world right now finding ways to play volleyball on their own. And those are the kids where some coach made them fall in love in the game from the time that they were 10 to 14. So uh, I think that's really important. And then I think from 14 to, I don't know, 16, 17, uh, it's probably a different domestically in the United States than it is internationally, but it's about getting them good at the entire game. So up until 17, I'd say, hey, like we're all getting better at every single skill. And we're probably going to start giving positions in there, but maybe they're not going to be set until you're 17, 18. And then at that point, it's probably pick a position and get special at something. You want to develop some sort of a superpower at that point. So I'm a really good attacker, or I'm really good at setting the long set if we're talking about setting, or if I'm a middle, I'm really good at running off one leg. But I think you want to have something that sets you apart from other people that you can build on as your career goes further for these international players. Obviously, if you're going into a college program, that's a little bit different. But uh, that's what I said for him. So I think up until 14, it shouldn't be, hey, you have a position. And maybe somewhere along those lines after that, you're starting to dive into something a little bit more specialized. Yeah, actually, when I was coaching in England, uh, the way they had things structured, and I don't believe they're continuous, um, but I'm curious to see if you've seen this anywhere else. They actually were working at the youth national team level, so U16, some, something like that, running a 4-2, running a and then progressed yeah. them to 6-2 once they moved up to U18s, eventually moving them toward the 5-1. The idea being at the younger ages, you're trying to develop as many setters as you possibly can in your pipeline. Yep. Um, yeah. Because you, otherwise you're not going to have that many. And uh, I don't know about England. I, I think if you want an example of who's doing it right from a youth development standpoint, I did a panel at the ABCA convention, uh, and Doug Beal was on it. There was a setter that came up through the Chinese system that was in there. But uh, I can't remember his last name. I know it starts with an M, but I'm pretty sure his first name was Jean-Pierre. Uh, and uh, he came from Canada. And we were having this conversation about like what we thought would be good. And he was like, well, let me tell you about the system in Canada. And by the time he got done with that conversation, I just came to the decision that if I have a kid and I want them to be good at volleyball, I'm moving my family to Canada. <laughs> but uh, they do a bunch of stuff. Like, I don't know, at the 12 and under range, uh, I think I can't remember what age it is, but the point goes like this. One team serves, the coach throws a free ball to one team, and then the coach throws a free ball to the other. Whoever wins two of the points gets to serve the next ball. Uh, and they're getting automatic rallies because they're getting these free balls. And I'm like, man, that is the smartest thing I've ever heard of. Uh, these kids play volleyball in an organized format, make it a little bit easier for them to play. And they had stuff similar where you're not allowed to have positions. Uh, I think up to a certain age, you're not allowed to substitute in the set. And the next set, you have to start with whatever kids didn't play in the first set. So uh, like I, I, if there's an example out there of what I think it should look like, I think Canada is doing a really good job. Okay. We've got a question from Simon. Uh, wants to know what you think about any special creative or emotional intelligence requirements. For setters, and yeah. if you see any difference between male and female athletes, uh, great question, Simon. Um, I think that goes back into the things you're looking for too, uh, and you bring up a really good point. Just that I think this person needs to be able to bring out the best in their hitters. They also need to know emotionally when someone is struggling, uh, and the coach can help out with this. And uh, I think you can kind of fill in areas, but it's really nice if you have someone that knows, hey. Sally's having a really tough time right now. I'm going to stay away from her these few. Or, hey, Sally's having a really tough time. I'm going to find a situation where I can get her a one-on-one -on -one where it's a really easy situation. She's going to go up and crush this ball and feel better. So I think the emotional piece is really important. Uh, do I think it's different on the men's and women's side? No. Um, maybe on the women's side, there's a few more swings emotionally. So maybe a little bit more important on the women's side. But I, I don't think that guys or girls are that much different. Guys have bad days, too. They show it. Uh, and I think they need to know what's going on there. So I think it's a really good question and a really good point. Okay. Uh, kind of on a related note with, in terms of the gender, are there any differences in the way, and this also comes from Dirk, 
in the way uh, to set the ball between men and women? And if so, which ones he wants? To yeah. Um, there's differences that happen. I'll say this. Uh, I think guys are going to set with their fingertips a little bit more. Uh, and there's also, and I, I don't know, I think we're going to go into technique a little bit on this too. I think of all skills in the game, this is the one that's top 57 different ways. Uh, I've gotten to the point where I think that these six things are important, but someone else might teach one or two of those things a little bit differently. But for the most part, when I see setters, these all things happen. But I know on the men's side, there's a little bit more upset and retract your hands going on a little bit. And I think it came from, uh, I know they're doing it in Italy. I, I know Tyler Hildebrand was doing a little bit with USA when he was in there. Um, I, I don't believe as much in that. Um, so I know that's going on. And I think the biggest difference, and this is just, uh, I don't know, mother nature, but guys are stronger than girls. Uh, and there's no, like, it's the one thing where, I, and when I took over the national team with Hugh McCutcheon, the women's national team, like there were a bunch of people saying, oh, women can't do this and women can't do that. And I wanted to throw up a middle finger and say, hey, no, I'm going to prove you wrong. Uh, and for the most part, there's not a ton of differences. Women can play the game very similarly to the men. Uh, and things that they said that women can't do, we proved them wrong on a lot of them. But just in general, men are stronger than women. You can see it in the weight room. You can see it all over the places. So it shows in setting just because guys are able to throw the ball around longer distances easier just because of strength. Um, so I think on the girl side, I've had to teach a few different techniques to maybe set the ball long and try to use your momentum to get it there as opposed to just get there, get your feet set, and push it back. Um, so I think for me, that's probably the one difference that I see. Uh, it's just you got to get the body to be a little bit more biomechanically efficient or maybe be a little bit less deceptive in order to set the ball long distances. Uh, but for me, that's that's the one difference I've really found, other than the fact that maybe the guys and the girls uh, are coaching it differently just because they're different volleyball worlds a little bit. They're separated slightly. Okay. Um, this comes from uh, Dario wants to know and, and I think this can apply for for not just what he's asking but he's the case question is in the training of more advanced players how do you um, he says dose the work between what he calls dry reps which are no hitter involved and you know ones where you're just setting the ball or, or ones where you do have a hitter um, hope presumably live do you consider that there to be any difference between what you're doing with younger players and older players in terms of how you're kind of distributing those sort of reps? Uh, younger player and older players, no. Um, I guess the one thing I'll say with the national team, you're dealing with your players a lot more during the day. Uh, so I don't know, for those of you that are listening that are international coaches, like collegiately, you only get to work with your athletes 20 hours a week. That includes weights, that includes video. Uh, so there's not a ton of time for practice. So usually you're seeing them once a day, whereas internationally, I'm often seeing my setters twice a day, three or four days a week. Uh, so there's more time to kind of do the dry work that you're talking about. And usually when I'm in that situation, I'll do the dry work in the morning, and then I'll apply that in some way and shape form to the afternoon. So an example of that, and I try to, I mean, I get what you're saying with dry in terms of not having a hitter. Uh, I would love to have one out there a lot. Sometimes I'll have coaches in and come in and hit quicks uh, just so we have a hitter there. But uh, one, I, I, I'll give you, I'll give you a story for this first, and then uh, uh, I'll give you kind of where I'm going with it. But I was working with a younger setter back in the United States, and uh, I was in there, and I was just tossing balls to her, working on, hey, we're going to work on this to move from this spot. And it took us half an hour to get it off the toss, and uh, she finally got it. She was feeling good. She got it in groove, and then I went in there, and the next, I had her get a drink of water, and we came back, and I was like, all right, now I'm going to pass the ball in some random spots. It went 100% back to what it was originally so once i went off this pass and she had to read this it went away and from that day forward i have never tossed the ball to a setter maybe i shouldn't say never that happened on occasion but for the most part i am always working off of a pass so i'm back here they're tossing the ball at me and i'm passing it this direction just so they're seeing this angle and where this ball is going uh and that's just so that they get the read and then attach that to what they have to go do so uh i i think you want to try to get away from dry reps as much as possible but you're going to have to go set the hoop with this position one uh i have a bad back and i think it's because when i was with the national team karch and i were hitting forty thousand balls a day during the winter just to try to get these things as game like as possible so uh, you're going to kill your coaches eventually but uh i think you want to get those reps as many times as you can so what i might do in my practices now is in the morning say hey we're going to work on setting this long ball from zone four i'm going to work off a pass a lot i'm going to say hey, every time it goes back here you're setting back to zone two 
Uh, and then in the afternoon, it might be, hey, we're going to do six on six, and we're going to do a serve and then two balls or something. And one of the balls is going to be from me, and I might mix in that ball that they have to go back here for. And they might not, I might say, it's not say, hey, you have to set this every time, but I'll talk to the setters and say, hey, I'm doing this for you so that you can work on what we worked on this morning. Uh, so I think tying in those dry reps to your six on six reps is important also if you have the time to do it. Uh, and for some of these people that are a club in the United States, which is junior volleyball, they might get six hours a week. Uh, so you're not going to have a ton of time to do those things. But I think as much as you can, tie those two things together. All right. On a related note, for, for the dry reps, um, he's wondering you know, if you're working with baskets, targets of some sort, um, how do you work to get the trajectory on the set that you want? Because sometimes if the ball just goes in the basket, it looks good, but it's not, it's not what you're looking for. And he's suggesting that he's trying to use some sort of like metronome type of, type of tempoing. Yeah. I've played around with the metronome. I think it's really hard because, again, if you're going off a toss, you can do it because you mm. get this rhythm. But if you're going off a pass, it's really hard to time this thing to the point where the setter is touching the ball, the metronome goes, and this goes. Um, and I use, I use a little bit of audio. Uh, Italy is doing a lot of this. Just uh, I use a lot of audio for blocking now just for reps. Instead of just doing reps, we're doing it to a beat. Um, but uh, I've had it really hard for setting. Um, uh, for me, there's some things that I had to do with our setters. I had to define the difference between higher, lower, faster, slower. Uh, and a lot of times when someone was saying, I need that higher, the setter would all of a sudden set a high ball next. So I think really defining on, hey, like the, the vocabulary that you want to use around this, like, no, I need that set faster. And then higher, lower, it just ends, is the ending point of the set. So where it ends up along the antenna. Whereas faster or slower is how long it takes to get there. And then you have a vocabulary around things. Uh, the other thing that I started doing is I started using, I use this for actually receiving jump spins too. Um, but we did some work with, uh, so if the net's the direction, we set up an elastic going this direction over the net. And we set it up the height that we wanted and kind of where we wanted it, the apex of the set to be. So where we wanted this thing to kind of come up and stop right here. We put a piece of elastic right here. And you have to make it a different color that contrasts the wall. But our setters actually kind of liked it of just trying to hit that elastic uh, and then get it in the hoop. So that way you're playing. Does that make sense for you, John? Just Yeah. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. We're, not, we're not seeing too much with your hands, but gotcha. I think you described it well uh, enough. And if, if yeah, people don't get it. Apologies to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. I'm stranded in New Zealand and data isn't very quick here. So, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so yeah, if the net's here, put a piece of elastic kind of going across the net. Uh, perpendicular to that uh, at the height that you wanted and just have your setters try to touch the, the elastic. But the biggest thing for me was the language piece of uh, defining uh, what those four things were. And the other one I'm just thinking about also, you can really dictate speed uh, that something has to go into the target at with where the target is angled at. So if the target's straight up and down at 90 degrees, it's really hard to get a high arcing set to go into it because it's going to hit the top of the target. And if the target's at 90 degrees, it's really hard to get a really fast low set to get in because you have to get over here. So uh, we play around with that. I'm just trying to think of other things that we did. I got really big on external feedback, so good kind of things. The other thing that I did was uh, I set a target up in the, the zone four area where I wanted it, and then I set a target up in the 31 gap area. Uh, and I put a piece of tape that kind of extended on the top of the target on the gap one on the 31. And they had to kind of set one into the 31, and then I wanted them just to miss it and hit the piece of tape and go over to the other one. Uh, and just random stuff like that, too, where we were trying to bounce one ball off the top of the target into the other one and trying to keep it fun for our setters. <laughs> Do you ever use the NOAA device? No. Uh, oh, yes, I have. Let me rephrase that. Um, I have used it. I found it was kind of hard to set up. Uh, and I wasn't getting the benefit from uh, from the use of setup. And then, if I remember correctly, this was a long time ago when it first came out. Uh, you have to set from the same spot in order to kind of have the trajectory be, because it's going to change depending on where you are. Mm -hmm. So if you're working in a random environment where I'm moving one ball to zone four and one ball to zone two, those two trajectories are going to be different a little bit. So uh, I and maybe they've improved on it since I used it. Maybe it's easier to set up and they can kind of go in a more random environment. Uh, but I haven't. For those of you that don't know what the NOAA device is, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, basically you'll set a ball. It'll tell you what the trajectory of the ball was. 
So you can try to match those things up. Am yeah. I right there? Yeah, it came Still from basketball originally, as I understand it. Yep. Which, I mean, I guess if you're thinking like developing a free throw shooter when they're shooting from the same spot every single time, yeah. perfect. Yep. Uh, yeah. And basketball has traditionally been a very blocked game, too. You're going to shoot from the same spot 50 mm-hmm. times until you get it. So right. uh, I like training in a little bit more random environment where they don't know exactly what's going on. So. Okay. Uh, we got a question as to, you talked about external cues. Uh, I think it's Ardilla wants to know uh, what external cues would you use for the slide and what internal ones would you use? From a setting standpoint, you ask questions about Yeah, we, I'm, we assuming it, I'm assuming it's from a setting standpoint. Uh, I don't think it's any different than other sets here. Um, I guess uh, one, uh, one I'll say this, I don't think it's any different from the stuff in front. I think when you're training those, especially with a dry environment, I like that. Uh, I like the terminology. We'll stick with it. If you're in that environment, uh, it might be the angle of the uh, uh, target. So if I'm trying to run a really fast slide back behind, I might angle it at 90 degrees and say, hey, you have to get it in here. If I want to use a little bit more shape, I'd go back in here. So use the target a little bit like that. Um, one of the other things I'll do from a target is, uh, I don't know, we had a rule that if the ball was pushed off the net and back towards zone two, we had to leave the set a little bit more inside. So I would move that target in, and I'd also say I wanted to give him a little bit more shape to give the hitter the time to get around. So I might say, hey, I'm going to move the target inside a little bit, facing the uh, setter where they're going to be, and then angle it down a little bit. So that's my external way of saying, hey, in order for you to get it into this target, it has to have a little bit more shape. Um, so that would be kind of an external cue there. Uh, and then the other one that I would talk to them about is, uh, we talked a lot about spacing when it came to the slide. Uh, and for those of you in Europe that don't use the terminology slide, that's off of one leg behind. Uh, but we would talk a lot about when the setter is touching the ball, the distance that the middle blocker should be behind them. So we usually set about one meter, three feet, a little bit less than that, somewhere in there. And I would talk to our setters a lot about the external cue here is if you don't see that spacing be right, you need to change the tempo of the set. So if the setter's here and the hitter's here and you want to set this person, that thing has to be higher. So it would be the one other external cue that I would use. Um, and then we used a lot of external cues for our hitters in that. So it would be uh, that spacing idea. Hey, when the setter's touching the ball, I want you to be this far behind. We would draw a box. Chris McGowan from Gold Medal Squared came in, and I liked this, but we would draw a box on the court that came from the net, maybe let's say uh, uh, one meter inside the sideline in zone two, and then one meter off the so three feet by three feet, we'd start a box that would be kind of towards the net and towards the sideline. And uh, the hitters had to get into the box behind in the back part of it. They couldn't break into it here because I was trying to get them to have an arced approach and not run straight across the net. Uh, so just them had that idea of kind of trying to break in the box in the back would be a hitter stuff. So there was some stuff there. Um, and then maybe if, if you're looking at video, uh, where the set would break the antenna. So, uh, where the set would go through the antenna, um, mm-hmm. would be kind of the external cues that I would use. And then internally, um, we talk a lot about, I guess externally too for the setters, but we talked a lot about finding the train track that you wanted to set on. Um, so what I meant by that is if they came off the net by three or four feet by a meter or so, and they wanted to set back here, I wanted them to get squared to zone four. I want them to have this imaginary idea of, hey, this is the path that I want the ball to go on. Uh, and then an ex- internal slash external would be like, I want to finish on that path. So I'm, if I'm facing zone four, if you're in zone four, and I know the slide is going to be over in this direction, I want to make sure that my hands finish on that track as much as I can. So it's not going to be go back and then try to get it over here. It's finish on that track. And if you watch video of the Dutch setters, you're going to see that quite a bit of them finishing in different lines uh, along their body. Okay. Uh, another one of Dirk's questions is, uh, the speed of the game goes are getting faster and faster. What has changed from a technical point of view in terms of footwork, arm and hand work, those, those sorts of things? Um, I don't think it's changed. I just think it's made them 25 times more important. Uh, and just uh, the margin for error is a lot slimmer when you're running faster. 
Uh, so it's really, really important that the ball be in an accurate spot. Um, so uh, I think all of the things that were important before are 20 times more important now. So uh, I think that's just one of those things you got to look at. So for me, uh, just when I was thinking about the questions he had, uh, I think what maybe when I was working with Gio uh, and I was at Vakif and I was in charge of the setters there in the offense, uh, he was really surprised at how much I focused on feet. Uh, and I usually start there just because I think it's really important that you get to the same spot in relation to the ball every single time so that just you want the ball to end up in the same spot every single time. So we should be taking it somewhere similar. That doesn't mean it's going to happen every single time in volleyball. And it doesn't mean we need to be able to set from different spots if the ball is here. But if I can, I want to get there and take this thing in a nice, strong position every single time. So um, for me, footwork's really important. I think, one, where we get to in relation to the ball is the same every single time. And two, uh, our feet feel the same every single time. I want my setters to feel comfortable every single time they set. So I'm really big on setters getting a nice, good left, right. So a little bump, bump. And again, I'll use rhythm with this. I'll put sound on and they'll be running around the gym. I'll joke around with kids when I'm teaching them. I'm like, I want you to walk to school like this. I just want you to be walking down the street and be like, bump, bump, left, right, left, right, left, right. Uh, but I talk to setters a lot about that being their comfort blanket. It's like they're four years old, three years old again, and they have this blanket that they carry around everywhere with them, and they can't take a nap with it because that's what makes them feel comfortable. So for my setters, I'm big on, on a good pass, them getting there and getting that comfort step, that left, right. And it's also a little bit of a last second adjustment. If I was, I don't know, four inches off of where I should be, that gives me the chance to get those four inches and get in a nice, strong position. So I think feet are important, and then the other one I'll teach, and people teach this differently. I think everyone, for the most part, will teach something similar on the net, but uh, I like my setters going off the right foot and pivoting for step off. Uh, I think it gives you a little bit more strength to go strong behind and go fast behind. So um, I'll teach those two pieces of footwork a lot, make sure people are getting really comfortable with those two things, and it looks similar every single time, because if you want the, the end product where the set ends up to be the same, I think it has to start the same also. So I think it's, that's important. Um, uh, I think the one thing that's maybe changed with speed of sets is just the trajectory of the finish. Uh, back in volleyball before, when people were setting high balls, everything was going up and things are going out now. Um, I think maybe because everything's going this way, there's a tendency, I don't know if video's working, but a tendency for setters to roll their shoulders forward, which ends up the ball going kind of down. So I've really been big on my setters leaning back as they're setting, so with their shoulders kind of facing back and setting. Um, and also just the idea that this lower body is fixed as they're setting. Uh, if you have 18 moving parts, the set's going to end up in 18 different places every single time. So I'm big on as little things moving as possible. So get your feet there, have your body be kind of in the same position. And the only thing that's moving is your arms and your wrists. Um, and then I'm big on, uh, uh, using big muscle groups instead of little ones. Uh, the analogy I use here, if you go and watch a putter and the PGA putting, they're not putting like this with their wrists. They're putting with their whole arms because big muscle groups are more accurate than little ones. So I'm big on when we're setting of our arms doing a lot of the work and our wrists just finishing to where we want to go. Uh, and our finish kind of stays the same regardless of the set. And if we're going long distances, our biceps and triceps push. If we're going short distances, they don't push very much. Uh, so I, I don't think these things are necessarily different. Uh, maybe the trajectory of where the set's coming out and how my release is going forward and maybe my upper body not moving is a little bit different but I just think because we're going faster uh, we're trying to get them on the same spot every single time uh, these things just the the magnitude of how important they are goes up all right um, you've kind of progressed along this path already when we're talking about the footwork especially uh, yeah. we do have a couple of questions from Matt and Ryan that are kind of related guys. I'll get to those uh, after this. I was curious about your progression. So when you take on a, a new setter it, or you're trying to evaluate a setter, obviously you just talked about how important the feet are. What is kind of your progression through evaluating them and, and then obviously developing and preparing them um, as you kind of refine them along the way? Yeah. So, like, when I was in the United States and I was working with uh, setters, especially, and I was doing, like, a private lesson or something, I'm sure parents were like, man, we just wasted our money. But the first 30 minutes would literally be me passing a ball to different parts of the court and just seeing what the motor patterns are right now. Like, when I pass a perfect pass, what does it look like? When I pass the ball to zone four, what does it look like? Uh, when I pass the ball to zone four and they're trying to finish back to zone two, what do the arms look like? Um, and kind of get an idea of, all right, here's where I need to start with. 
Uh, so that would be number one of just, hey, understand what you're working with. Uh, uh, and then step two would be, what is the most important thing that I need to teach right now? Uh, and might be step two, especially if I have an, an hour with somebody, it might be, hey, like, let's do 30 minutes, kind of maybe a little bit less than that, of figuring out where we need to pour in some work. And then normally I would pick one thing that was really easy to change that was going to make a difference in this person's life. Um, so when I start with teams, I usually start with serving because I think it's the easiest skill to change. And what happens is if someone makes a change in a day, they buy into you, one, so they know you know what you're talking about because you were able to do something that day. Uh, and number two, uh, it kind of lights a fire of, hey, I'm going to come back and get better at something else the next time. Uh, so that would probably be step one for me of, hey, what's the easiest thing I can change where this person's going to have a light bulb moment, an aha moment, where they're going to leave being a little bit more hungry to come back the next time. Um, so that'd be step one. Uh, step two would be uh, probably a big bout of footwork. Um, I really want them to understand, hey, in these situations, I want this. In these situations, I want this. And I would go to work on that. Um, and then from there, it would probably be dictated on what I saw from that first 30 minutes. So it might be, hey, I'm watching this setter and they're setting and their finish looks like this with one arm going down. I would try to get these things even. Uh, so that, hey, this, this moment, like, and realistically, and I talk about this with passing too, I think feet are important with setting. I think they're important. You have to get there every single time. But if I'm really, really good here, this is the thing that's going to matter the most. Same thing with passing. If I'm really good with my platform and I could go like this and pass and with one arm in the other direction, get it to go where I want it to go, but I have such a good feel, I'm still going to be good. But I think there's things that can get us to that point more. So with uh, passing, for example, if I'm falling down as I'm passing, odds are I'm not going to be a great passer. So feet are important. But with setting, realistically, where the rubber meets the, mo meets the road is with my hands. So it might be, hey, if I see this going on, we're going to try to change this so these things come out even every single time. Um, and, and then it might be trying to refine kind of that, so the location. And, and I guess the other thing that I'll talk about, too, is I really try to train, uh, and I tell my setters this all the time, like, I want you to be good in this order. I want you to have good location first. I want you to have good tempo second. I want you to be deceptive third. Uh, so I'll really train on that. So again, that's where I go to hands. This is going to give me a good location. If I'm going uneven and this hand's pushing through more, the ball is going to come off the net when I'm setting the zone four. So I might go there. So then it's going to be a little bit setter specific, uh, of, Hey, how do we get this even, or how do we push this ball longer to zone two? Uh, but I'm going to look for the areas where, again, it's going to give me my biggest bang for my buck. If we're going to pour in 30 minutes of attention on this one thing. I better hope it makes you better uh a significant amount so i'll look for those things um and then from there i'm really big on having offensive setters uh i want to have as many attacking options as i can on my team so when you're in the two hitter rotations i really like them setting over on two dumping uh, on a tight ball being able to throw it deep to the zone five corner uh so i'll usually mix in a little bit of that into every single practice or maybe I'm blending it in with something where they're uh, working on a ball to zone four, but I might throw in, hey, every once in a while I'm going to say dump, and they're going to throw the ball over. Um, so we'll usually have a little bit of that in there. Uh, and then once I have those things kind of done, again, I've, uh, I've gotten footwork down. Um, I've gotten their finish kind of even and going. They can set the ball long in both directions. Then I'm going to teach them how to be a little bit deceptive. Um, so how to fake out a middle blocker a little bit, how to hang in the air, how to, I don't know, act like they're going to hit was the one thing we had the last year while I was at Netherlands and then set out of it. Um, so I might add a little bit of deception at the end there. Uh, and then it's, it's, I mean, all this entire time, I would say the other thing that I didn't even think about as I was kind of prepping this stuff is how to think about the game. Um, so from the beginning of this, it's, Hey, how do I look across the net? Understand that that's their weakest blocker. This is my best hitter. Uh, I know this middle blocker is going to step this direction if I run a back one. Let's run a back, back one step out to this really good hitter. So trying to make sure we talk about those situations also and how we think about the game uh, is important that entire time. Okay. Uh, just going back to what you were saying about make, getting the easy win, is there anything that you know you kind of think uh, think that's – like you talked about you know, working with a team, you'll, you'll hit on serving because uh, it tends to be an easy win. Are there any kind of things that you generally see as the easiest thing to fix with a setter? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I think it's one of the hardest skills to teach just because uh, it, it's kind of like golfing. I use golfing as an example a lot for this because, uh, but it's golfing times like 20. Um, it's, the, it's the one skill in volleyball where you're really trying to be accurate within inches or centimeters. You're trying to set this ball and try to get it into this exact same spot every single time. But unlike golf, we're having to move as we do it. Uh, so it's so complex and so intricate that there's so many little things. Um, I think footwork can happen. I think uh, when you teach some biomechanical stuff to set the ball long, like I think Saturday, and they never mastered it in a day, but like I remember I was in uh, Turkey and I was working with uh, uh, John Sue, the setter that's uh, with the national team now actually. Uh, and she was a backup setter then. And one day we were working on just setting long sets over her right shoulder. And I, I was impressed actually. I, mean, I'm a, I was tossing balls outside of the zone four area, like off the court on the left side of the court. And she was setting in system balls back to zone two. Uh, and she couldn't do it consistently, but just the fact that she, she could do it once, like you could see her eyes go, Oh my God, I didn't know I was capable of that. So in terms of, Hey, like quick fixes where they're going to be able to do it in sixes tomorrow. No. In terms of light bulb moments, we're like, man, like I'm onto something here. I think you can teach some stuff that they're gonna they're gonna get excited about it. But uh, there's so many moving parts to setting that I don't think there's anything that's easy to stick. And the reason why I say serving is easy, it's it's the one closed loop skill in volleyball where I'm not having to move and go do something for it. Sure. And like I'm tossing my own ball, I'm doing stuff. So, um, so like I think that's easy. But in, in setting, there's so many things that happen. I think it's hard to do. All right. On your analogy, not only are you moving, but the ball's moving too. Yeah, exactly. There's all <laughs> moving parts. So, yeah, our our sport is crazy like that. Like it's probably like, that's why I don't know. I love coaching it, and I look at it. And people are like, oh, volleyball, and I'm like, man, you're mixing like golf, basketball, uh, and all of these other things into this. I don't like. It's the most highly skilled uh, moving sport I think there is. Like when you're in basketball, like you're in control of dribbling the ball or catching it and then going up to shoot, but when you're, I mean, maybe an alley-oop is the one thing in basketball that's kind of similar, but when you're attacking a volleyball, like, you have, hey, am I going to get set, am I not? And you have, hey, is this thing going to come in? And do I have one block or do I have two? And what's their defense? And there's all these things. Or when I'm passing a volleyball, it's this really skill-driven thing where someone's serving this thing, and not only are they choosing where the ball is going to go, but the ball's choosing where the ball is going to go and floating around like crazy. So uh, it's one of the things I love about our game is, like, it's, it's so unique. Which is cool because like we're different, but it's also hard because you can't really look at other sports and say, "Hey, like let's coach it like this." Uh, so yeah, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. I, I love our game. Yeah, well, and and on top of just the skill element, how, you know, what other sports do you not know if the ball's like in reception? You're not sure if the ball's coming to yep. you or coming to your teammate. It's not like baseball. Baseball, you can look at it. Yep. Oh, it's all right, similar to reception because you got to time the ball. Blah blah blah. Yeah, but you don't have to figure out whether it's your ball or not. <laughs> yep, exactly. All We're right. unique. I love yeah. it. Okay, we've got some decision-making questions. So Matt yep. wants to know, how do you train setters decision-making specific to making the deceptive slash athletic set versus making the easier set? And do you recommend making situational distinctions like end of match, for example? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, too. Um, I think you want, I, I think end of match, let me say this, I think end of match, I, I like my setters to keep it fairly simple. I don't like them to go crazy and feel like they have to do too much just because that moment's already asking so much of them. I don't want them to feel like they have to go above and beyond that. So I'll usually say like, Hey, make the smart decision. Don't try to be tricky. Don't try to be deceptive. Just get the person that needs to get the ball, the most hittable ball possible. Um, and then from there, I'll say, I usually, I kind of developed a system with our setters where they would kind of, uh, and I think this is the other thing with setters is when you're choosing them, you want to have someone that's honest and loyal to you because you're going to have conversations like, hey, this person is twice as good as this person, but you don't want them to go to that person and say it, obviously, because you want that person to be confident in that moment. So we kind of developed a system with our setters where kind of we ranked our hitters on a kind of one to 10 scale. Uh, and said, hey, this person's this, or hey, this middle is this in front, a uh, six in front, and an eight behind. Uh, and then we would kind of say, like, situationally, like, hey, that person's going to get bumped up if they're going against a really bad blocker. So maybe that's plus one points. Or, hey, if I can guarantee a one-on-one, -on -one, that's plus three. So if my worst attacker is over here in zone two, but 
Uh, maybe I can, for sure, I can run a 31 and get them a one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe that becomes a really good decision then. So we'll talk about that a little bit. I think this depends on your level. If you're coaching 12s, it's, hey, don't even think about this. Just put up a pitable ball. If you're coaching 16s, it's start talking about, hey, here's a weak walker. Let's go after this person a little bit more. Uh, and, hey, in this situation in transition, you went to our worst hitter. Hey, I don't care what's 14, 13, and uh, the game's on the line. Go to the person that's going to step up the most. And going back to the emotional intelligence question earlier, hey, understand in this transition opportunity, this is the person that's going to go up and take the big swing at this ball. Go to that person. So, and again, like just going back to the last conversation I had where there's so many moving parts setting, there's so many moving parts within this. A lot of times it has to be, hey, you know that decision at 14-14? Next time this happens, let's do this. And it might be a year till that happens. But you just want to fill up the uh, mental encyclopedia for the setter of these different situations and go into them. Um, and then the deceptive piece. So I guess going back to the question, uh, crunch moments, say, hey, if my best hitter is on their worst blocker, I'm not going to try to be tricky. I might even say, hey, let's give them a little bit of spit height on this ball so that they go up and over this good blocker. Don't even worry about speed. Uh, so in that situation, maybe, hey, we're going to keep it simple and go to this person. Or if there's this great play call that we can set up that's going to get a one-on-one, -on -one, let's do that. But it's usually in those crunch situations, it has a little bit more to do with mentality than it does kind of the matchup. So, hey, this person's going to go up and take a big swing at this. Um, and then the deceptive piece, I, I usually start with my setters. I say, hey, do it in easy situations. So it might be, hey, if you get a free ball and you know you're going to get this perfect pass, uh, maybe that's the time to hang and try to get them to bite on the quick and go outside. Uh, so we talk about situationally there when to be deceptive. Hey, take the easy situation and maybe go about it then. Um, but it's going to be this evolving thing with your setter where you're having conversations during timeouts. Like, hey, do you remember that play two plays ago? And this might be the one position where I do during a match, especially in the easier matches, have a lot of those conversations. So uh, I think for outsides, for middles, it's, hey, how do we win the next point? With my setter, just because those situations don't happen as often, I might be talking about those situations within the game. Hey, remember three plays ago when this happened? Next time that happens, if it does, make sure we do this. Uh, and I think that's an evolving thing. But uh, Talking about the situations, difficult situations, keep it simple. For me, easy situations, free balls. Uh, I know I have an easy setter. Hey, go ahead and hang here and do this. Um, uh, I won't give too many things away just in case I'm coaching somewhere and someone's listening right now. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, kind of kind of those kind of situations. And, and really just it, it's such an evolving thing with your setter. I think you have to talk through each and every one. Sure. Um one of the problems that, that we can have with setters is they don't make the right choice in the moment out of basically fear, lack of aggression. Like we know the percentages yep. say you should be setting the middle X, X amount of time or in this certain scenario because you know they're the, they're the best probability of scoring. But that's a risk set for the setter because it's easy for them yep. to mess up. Uh, I think somebody was talking about it in one of these other, other conversations. I think it might have been Mark Levitt. If a setter, if there's an error in a quick set, everybody blames the setter. If there's a set, if there's an error in a high ball, that goes on the hitter. So how do we train our setters to get over that? It's my fault or it's their fault. You know that that fear that I'm going to look bad, sort of sort of issue. Yeah, I think this is a bigger thing than just setting. Uh, I think if you. If you want to answer this question, I would get a sports psychologist on, call Andrea Becker and get her on for an hour because that could be a whole hour-long conversation. Um, I, I, think there's, I think there's two things that I'll say here. I think, one, there's skills that can prepare you for these moments. Uh, and what I mean by that is breathing skills to kind of get you back into what needs to be done. Uh, and uh, so I think, again, that could be an hour-long conversation that I'm not – I'm equipped to talk about, but I'm not the expert, so I'm not going to go into detail on that. Um, and then the other piece is uh, we had a chance with the national team to talk to Kobe Bryant back in the day. And uh, the story has just been ringing in my head. And I usually share it with other, other uh, my, most of my teams. But I won't give the whole story because it's about 10, 15 minutes long. Um, but it comes down to basically he was talking about uh, the question that was asked of him is, hey, there's 1.7 seconds left on the clock. You know the ball is coming to you. What's running through your head? Um, and he kind of actually shared a story about his daughter. I'm not sure which one, which obviously becomes a little bit more uh, eerie now. But uh, he talked about his daughter being in a play, and he got down to the end of the play, and he talked to her. and she, He saw her beforehand, 
and she didn't look nervous. And he was like, what was running through your head? And uh, she said, like, this is awesome. And he was like, what do you mean this is awesome? He's like, he, she was like, all the work that we did, we put this costume together, we did all these things, all of the practice, all of these things, it prepared me for this moment. And this is awesome that I get to step out here and I get to go do these things. I get to be the person that gets to go out here and perform this. And Kobe was like, that's how I feel. He's like, I put in the work. I put in, I know I put in more work than anybody else on this court. Uh, and like, I, I'm the person that has earned the right to step out here and do this. So I think there's this, there's this piece of earning the right to go out and do it. Uh, and yeah, you're going to, you're going to feel nervous if you're not prepared to go out and do that thing. But if you know, you put in every bit of work that you can, uh, you're prepared for that moment and you should be the one to go out and do it. So, uh, I think there's that preparation piece too. Yeah. If you're not good at setting quick, yeah, you're going to be nervous at setting quick. Uh, and if you haven't div dove into the fact that you're not good at it because you're scared of it and you're ashamed of it. And again, this is a sports psychologist piece too. And you don't have a growth mindset on it of, Hey, I'm going to get better at this thing. I'm not great at, I'm going to put in the work so that I'm not nervous the next time. Uh, then yeah, you're going to be nervous the next time. So I think it's the athlete diving into, Hey, I'm not great at this. I'm going to put in the work to the point where I do. And you hear stories about Kobe, about, uh, Michael uh, Jordan. You hear about all these people. They miss that game winning shot. They're the first one in the gym the next day working on that exact same shot. So it's not, Hey, I'm, if they're not, Hey, I'm not, I think it was a quote about Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan doesn't lose. He just hasn't had enough time to figure out how to win yet. Like if he hadn't done it in the game, he's going to go out that next morning and be like, Hey, I'm working on the shot until I have it. So that the next time I step into that position, I'm confident enough to go do it. So I think it's those two pieces of training mental skills and then working hard enough to the point where you're confident to go out and do those things. Uh, Juliana has asked, asked a question along these lines of what are some wash drills slash games you suggest uh, for them to think about the game? So to help develop that awareness and decision making. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll do stuff. I'm, I'm trying to think along these lines. Um, I, one, I'll start with this. I don't think it has to be a wash game. Um, uh, there's a lot of times, and again, I don't like and maybe I should be better at this. I don't like yelling in the middle of my gym, like, hey, you have a really bad blocker out in zone four. Why aren't you going to this person? Uh, but usually, like, a lot of times in, in practice, I think you have to coach that decision-making thing as much as you coach the other thing, maybe more. When you're getting the six-on-six, six, a lot of my feedback is about decisions, like, more than it is about uh, uh, technique. Um, but so I might pull my setters to the side and, like, after the play, and instead of being like, hey, I needed to finish evenly there, it's, hey, what were you thinking on that? Uh, on that decision and they'll go through it and I'll be like, well, hey, you have this person out here. Like that ball has to be set up in this. Maybe we want to run this play in order to get this one-on-one, -on -one. but in that situation, we should be going back to that person. So similar to what I talked about during the game of being hey, three decisions ago, you did this. I think that has to happen in practice a lot. Um, other things you can do are, uh, we'll do stuff like, I don't know, we'll do bingo in our gym where one team kind of has to do certain things. Um, but you can do stuff where you're not telling the setter what happened, but the middle has to commit on every single quick during this game. And the setter doesn't know it. They have to pick up on it within it of, hey, this person is jumping every single time. I'm going to go away from the middle now. Or, hey, the zone four blockers have to help really, really aggressively for this round. Uh, but maybe telling one side what they have to do and letting the other setter figure it out uh, is one of the other things you can do. Um, those are the first two things that come to mind but the majority of what i'm doing is isn't rocket science it's not like i'm designing a drill for decision making it's more hey we're going to talk about decisions as they happen within the game um so yeah I, I guess the other thing you can do is just say if they're not good at something force it within the game so hey we're gonna we're gonna run a serve and two free balls two of the three have to go quick um the other side knows it and you're gonna get a little more help on the quick but uh that way they're kind of forced in those moments of having to do the thing they're not great at or bonus bonus the thing they're not good at so hey we're gonna run uh i don't know you can do anything you want in this instance but any quick kill is worth two points um that way in order to win they have to go do it yeah that's the the bonus points when it, it makes me think of something from a couple of seasons ago when uh we had two setters in preseason and you know we're deciding or we're in the process of deciding who's going to start and we're using Ooh. bonus points in games like along those lines and one of the observations we make is that one setter is winning all the time because she's using the bonus points and the other setter isn't going for the bonus points hardly ever. We had to sit down with her and have a discussion like this matters. This is part of yep. your job. 
Yeah, uh, the same thing happened. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll share this story too. The same thing happened in Turkey while I was with Vakif. We had Nas as one setter and Jansu, the second setter, is the other one. Nas is maybe the most competitive human being I've ever played against and also one of the smarter setters I've ever coached. Like she was just tearing her apart just because like every ball would be set quick and she would just understand the bonus structure. And some of it has to do with the competitiveness too. Like you want that person that's competitive and smart that figures out, hey, I have to do this in order to win. But I think you have to have that conversations with somebody, those conversations with people too. And uh, and I think also use the other person as an example. Uh, and I think Johnson got really good because of that. She had Nas as this example of uh, this is what competing looks like and this is what making these decisions look like. And we would all talk as a group about those. And we would talk about what decisions were good, what decisions were bad. And uh, I would send out videos of, hey, this this is, I don't know, five minutes of decisions. This was a great one. This wasn't. So I think one person learning from the other is important too. But yeah, I think you might have to sit down with them at first and be like, hey, or, or, or ask the question. I'm big on questions. Why did you lose that round? And a lot of times they're going to be like, yeah, I don't know. And you're going to have to walk through it. But sometimes they might understand it. Mm-hmm. And then be like, all right, well, let's go do it again. And then you see the behavior change. But uh, you want to change behavior as much as you want to change skill. Right. All right. Well, to give some people chances to ask any more questions they might have, uh, we're going to shift a little bit in focus, still on setting, but Dirk had asked a question uh, about Libros and setting mm-hmm. and how you work with. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think I, I was doing this. Um, and when I got there, my Libros weren't great at using their hands. Um, and Italy is taking it a whole other step and you're seeing the world kind of change now. Uh, but I'm a big believer that your Libros need to be the second best setter on your team. And maybe your starting Libro is the second best setter on your team. Maybe they're better than your second setter. Uh, but that person I think touches more balls than we give them credit for. Uh, a lot of people are intentionally hitting at setters. I know at the younger level and just, uh, you do it just because no one else on the court can set, but I'm really big on that Libro or somebody. When we were at USA, Jordan Larson was one of the better non-setting setters in the world, so we let her set a lot of the balls. But uh, I think you're going to start seeing this internationally where the Libro is running the offense now or somebody else is running the offense. Uh, Just because the game's kind of leaning towards more speed, you're starting to see setters and middle blockers that they're in there who are setting that ball being able to run an offense. You're seeing Italy setting quicks now, which I wasn't trying to do. I was just trying to get some tempo in both directions to try to spread the court a little bit. Um, but I think you have to teach these people how to set the ball. And, uh, the question Dirk asked was just, what are you teaching? And I don't think it's any different than when you're teaching your setter. It's just mirrored. Uh, so instead of squaring up to zone four, I have them square up to zone two and then they're setting over their shoulder. So they're trying to be a little deceptive there. And instead of going off their right leg, uh, sorry, no, they're still going off the right leg, but they're pivoting for a different reason is so that they can stay behind a three meter line. And, uh, and I think the one thing that uh, it starts with a dig. So I think it's changing the setter's mind that, Hey, when they're digging the ball, it's not just to get it up. It's to put it right in the middle of the court, right behind the three meter line. So that person can use their hands. So, um, so I teach a lot of the same things. It's just, I think the biggest thing is, uh, getting your Libros to trust that they can use their hands. Um, and I think when I'm watching, uh, juniors, uh, club volleyball in the United States, I think my biggest pet peeve, and I'm uh, there's kind of a push out there now to get rid of the double contact rule. I am 100% in favor of this, but I just hate when I see referees waiting to blow their whistle when somebody other than the setter sets the ball. The fact that we're being stricter on people that are worse at a skill is absolutely insane to me. Uh, if anything, we should be laxer with those people that are learning, especially at the younger age groups. So um, I think there's a big thing on getting your Libros confident enough to use their hands to go out there and run the offense. And obviously that's going back to what I shared with the MJ and Kobe thing of it takes some work to go in there and do that. You got to earn that confidence. So um, I was pretty happy with what we did in the Netherlands with our Libros. They both got a lot better at setting with their hands. Yeah. I think there's also something to be said for coaches, not constantly just saying, do the easy thing. 100%. Especially with juniors. You got to let the kids develop. So you got to encourage them in that direction. Yeah, but I also, I, I, 100%, I think this, the rules are dictating that. Mm-hmm. Like, and I understand when coaches say, hey, don't even start using your hands. The referee's waiting to blow their whistle. Like, yeah, that, that's it's probably true. But they're never going to get to the point where they're going to be elite with that mindset. So, right. one, yeah, the coaches need to be like, hey, I don't care if you get called on a double right now. Let's focus on being good, I don't know, six months down the line. Uh, but the second piece, I, I do think the rules could lend themselves to people improving at those younger age groups. 
All right, uh, Simon's got a question uh, that is about where you think things are going to be going. Uh, do you think it will be po become popular in the women's game to attack the second ball like Ingepeth uh, and, and some other men do? Or, and sometimes he doesn't even attack yeah. the ball. He fakes it and sets it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what he's talking about, for those of you who are listening, they don't know who Ingepeth is. He's a player for the French national team. Um, but what they'll do is they'll set him on a pipe on a second ball. So the setter will just bump up a high ball to the pipe, and they'll go up fake to hit it. And then he'll either hit it or he'll set it out to the antennas. Um, I've seen teams play around with it. Uh, I, I do think it works if you have a really good pipe hitter that will draw some attention. Um, what I haven't seen work as much is just setting the first ball out. For some reason, teams seem to be ready for that. So I've seen teams send a free ball and somebody just set out. And that hasn't been effective. I, I do think that works because it draws all the blockers in and then they're setting out. It's just in the women's game, you don't have that many dominant pipe hitters. So uh, I think Ju Tang for China could probably do it. Um, uh, that might be it that I'm thinking of. A lot of the other dominant back row hitters are opposites. Um, so uh, so maybe with a special player, yeah. But I think you're going to see it more in the men's game than you're going to see it in the women's game. The, the, the pipe thing actually brings up a, a question that I got when I was in Switzerland back in September. One of the coaches I, I visited with asked me the question is if I'd ever, if I'd seen any women's teams be effective running the pipe. And, and I know there's been a lot of talk over the years that the back row attack in the women's game is, is not effective. And, you know, some people have argued they shouldn't even bother using it. Obviously at the international level and probably the professional level at a certain point, it can be quite effective. Um, yeah. But even even below that, the, my observation on that trip was, well, yes, it can be effective if you're using it the right way, not just throwing up a random ball in the middle of the court. Yeah. Are you, are you asking the question? Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> Go on. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, uh, so here's my take on this is, again, like there's small differences in the men's and women's game, and I think the back row attacking is one. Um, I think there's some things that cause it to be different. One, like I said, men are stronger than women it's just a physiological fact and they tend to jump higher which means they can jump longer uh and if you watch guys hit and they're hitting a back row attack they're practically contacting it at the net uh and just when you're contacting the ball at the net you can hit it down more and hit with some more angles whereas women can't broad jump as far uh so uh, i think that's the bigger reason is that the, the the decrease in the height of the net doesn't make up for the fact that women can't get as close to it uh, and you and you'll see exceptions to this, and usually it's the freak athletes around the world. So Paolo Agano for Italy jumps higher than most men, uh, so she's able to get close to the net, hit with some crazy angles. Boscovich, same thing. Ju Ting, same thing. Uh, and you'll get like Annie Bausch for our team with Holland was really good, and Lonnie was good. But you see these jumpers that can jump long distances and get close to the net are the ones that can do it. And the other thing that you're going to see is, uh, for me, I think women need a longer runway to get closer to the net. So they need to start further back in order to do it. So on the men's side, you can see guys pass the ball and go hit this thing. On the women's side, I just I don't see anybody able to do that as well, uh, be able to use a short one way, create enough speed to get close to the net. Um, and you'll see China do it with Ju Ting, but usually once she hits it, they'll pull her out of service to you, and then you know they're going to go to her. So um, I think it's a lot harder for women to pass and go hit this thing. Um, than it is for, than it is for guys. So I think there's some exceptions to it. Um, and again, like this is one of the things when we came in with, from the men's national team, we came into the women's. And we're like, no, like screw you, world. Like we're going to prove you wrong. Uh, so we were hitting out of the back row a lot, and we couldn't get the efficiency to be as close as what it was in the men's game. Because if you look at a guy's game and guys are hitting out of the back row, the efficiency is sometimes higher than what it is out of the front row. Mm -hmm. Where in the women's side, uh, it it very very rarely, unless you have a special athlete and it's in system, are you going to be able to go there? So I agree with what you said with the, the if thing. If it's used right, yeah. Uh, we talked about a lot of situations. And, like, again, that would be in practice being, like, the three times that it would happen in practice where I'm like, that's the time for the pipe. I'd stop it and you'd talk to our setters and be, hey, that's the time we need to set it right there. Uh, so I think, it, I think those times are a lot less frequent uh, in the women's game than they are in the men's. Yeah, if, the observation that led me to, to to respond to that Swiss coach was I had just come from Spain, so I spent like two weeks watching Spanish teams train. And that's not exactly the highest level in the world, but the pipe could be effective if they could do something with the middle, the other side, get them to yeah. flinch one direction or another, yeah. you know, 
destabilize the block, basically. Yeah. And there's times, and again, I, I, people are going to play against me sooner or later. So, uh, <laughs> but there's times where like, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to have a middle blocker uh, approaching. So I do want to threat in the middle of the court. Uh, so again, I, I'm trying to get them to set it enough that people are worried about it, but not enough that it's going to drag our efficiency down of our offense. So like, there's times where I'm like, Hey, like, the middle needs to become our quick attack, or sorry, the pipe needs to become our quick attack. So uh, we'll talk about those situations too, and when we want to set a little bit more. But yeah, I agree. Like if you can get the middle to go somewhere, or the one thing when I really studied this and looked at the numbers was just if you can guarantee a one-on-one -on -one or a one-on zero. So it's a good, it's an okay thing to set. So the number of blockers that are going to be in there matters. So like we would talk to our setters, hey, if I know the zone four blocker is going to leave with a slide, and the zone two blocker is never going to help on the pipe it's a good opportunity, but if that's going to happen half the time, it's a bad choice. So we would talk about that also, just the number of blockers that are going to be involved there. Okay. Um, we're, we're basically an hour in. So uh, if, if nobody has any additional questions, we're, we're close to wrapping up. The one last thing that, that Dirk had tossed out there was um, what does a very good setter at the international level need um, above and beyond the sort of stuff that you already talked about earlier? uh yeah you saved the longest question for last probably um yeah they need a lot i think the biggest thing is the ability to side out uh obviously that's their job is to go in there and side teams out so i mean i have had a, a bunch of different types of setters i mean when we were at usa we had lindsey berg we had alicia glass and uh one is small and a little bit of a blocking liability the other is probably the best blocking setter in the world so but they could both side their team out so uh, I think that's the most important thing. And if you look at uh, the setters that are setting teams, that's the one thing they all have in common, is they're the best person that's able to go out and do that. And I think you do that through smarts. Uh, so again, ability to find the right person to set at the right time. That can be emotional or volleyball smarts. So hey, that's a small blocker. I'm going to go after this person with my best hitter. That's volleyball smarts. Or hey, I know this person's really good under pressure or really bad under pressure. I'm going to go back here in this situation. That's emotional smarts. So, I think that piece of it, um, and then kind of the, what I talked about, location, tempo, deception, um, I think those go into setting out. Can I set a consistent ball in the same spot every single time? Can I set it with the right speed? And then can I be deceptive in the right moments to try to get a one-on-one? -on -one? Um, I think uh, if you're talking about a good international setter, they need to be able to set all options on the court and from as many places as possible. Uh, so again, I talked about with setters, I think the thing that sets them apart if I'm looking internationally um, hey, I can work with this person, is can they set the long ball with speed from long distances? So can I throw somebody to the sideline in zone four and have them set a fastball back? I have something I can work with here physically. Um, so I, I think that kind of sets them apart uh, for me. And then uh, can I set quick from different parts of the court? I think uh, I have some favorite plays in volleyball. One of them is I have the video play of Ricardo from Brazil. And at one point, like, the ball gets passed over, passed into zone two. And it's so far past the sideline that he leaves the picture. And he sets a 31 from that spot. And I'm just like, that is unbelievable that he's able to do it. And, again, that's what set him apart. Or there was another play where uh, he was, I don't know, 20 feet back, six meters back into the court, and pushed back towards his own one sideline and sets this in-system ball over his shoulder while facing zone four uh, to Dante or somebody back there. I can't remember who. Uh, Andre, I think they're lefty, and just he crushes this ball, and just his ability to, and I remember Timmons had a similar set back in the 80s with USA, but there's these plays that I remember where these setters are just setting these amazing balls from long distances, so I, I think that sets people apart, they're able to kind of set everything from everywhere, um, and then the setters that are kind of deceptive with that too, so I think if you look at uh, Maya Janovic for Serbia, I think she's one of the better setters in the world right now, but she's one of the hardest people to read because she takes the ball from all these different spots and is able to have location. So um, I know I said taking the ball in the same spot is important, but I think once you're good enough, it's being able to be deceptive a little bit within this. So um, I think that's that. And then uh, being able to get a swing on everything. I'm really big with this on our team. So uh, being able to put up a hittable ball on balls that get put into the net. So if someone passes a low ball into the net, we practice this every once in a while. I think some of my other favorite plays are when, uh, when people – sorry, my battery's getting a little low here – uh, Almost when people done. pass the ball outside, the, when people pass the ball on the outside the antenna on the other side of the net, uh, instead of being able to run under and go set a ball there, that just it makes them special. You see Bruno do it with Brazil all the time. So I just think that's what makes people special. 
Uh, and again, this develops with time. At first, it's that love for volleyball, and then it's all around volleyball, and then it's uh, and then it's become have a superpower, and then it's kind of develop as many superpowers as you can to be the best in the world. Um, so uh, for me, I love offensive setters. So I really try to teach that a lot. So hey, can I set over? You watch Maya and Avec too for uh, for Serbia. Just she'll take the ball and dump it over with two hands, and she's a part of the offense. So uh, I think that's important. And then uh, I think when we talk about this and setting, and this happens so many times. It happens to me all the time too, where you're doing uh, small group stuff with everyone else and with every other skill. You're working on everything. My middles are learning how to set. They're learning how to block. They're learning how to do these things. My outsides, you're doing some blocking, some passing, some digging. And then you get to your setting thing and you just get so carried about setting, you train it for 45 minutes and that's the end of the small group. And I just think you have to be good at the other stuff too. Uh, and if you look at the best setters in the world, they're good at everything. And I tell this to every young coach that I'm ever talking to that's coaching juniors and stuff like that. I guarantee you that any player on my team at any position is going to be better than any player on your team. If I took my middle blocker and then put them outside hitter at a 16s level, they're going to be better than your outside hitter. So these people aren't just better at being, being better at being a middle blocker. They're better at volleyball at every single skill. So I just think with setting, we forget about it so many times because we get so obsessed with, hey, we got to get better at this. And it is the most important thing that they're going to do. But we forget to train them to be a good blocker, to be a good defender, uh, to go out there and do these other skills to serve. Uh, so I think that's important, too. All of these things add to value in terms of what they're doing. So uh, I just think you can set yourself apart that way, too. Um, and again, your superpower as a setter could be I'm the best blocking setter in the gym. That's going to set you apart. Yep. All right. I think we're going to wrap it up there. That was a good way to, to finish right. it off. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks, everybody, for, for turning yeah. out and all the questions. Really appreciate it. Yeah. And Thanks for doing this, too. Thanks for no getting back to volleyball. <laughs> Definitely.